Thank you for the invitation. Um, well, so where am I? Uh, oh. Right, so uh, the first word in the title, uh, we all know a lattice in Rn is the set of z-linear combinations of a basis of Rn. And in this talk, I'll always imagine that the standard dot product on Rn is, is fixed in the ambient space. So um, here's a brief overview of what I'd like to talk about. Um, first, I'd like to describe the space of all lattices in Rn, the, this collection of all lattices, what does that look like as a topological space and some related spaces. I'll say a few words about why these spaces are important and why uh, we need to compute their cohomology in specific examples. Uh, but the computations do become very large. Uh, so to do the computations, we introduce the well-rounded retract, which is a, a cell complex which, you know, we can, with which we can compute the cohomology. Um, I'll talk a bit about HEC operators, which are a natural family of commuting operators just defined in terms of things you uh, do with the lattices. The commuting operators on the cohomology, and whenever you have commuting operators on something, then you get yeah, their eigen, you know, you have a simultaneous diagonalization, and the eigenvalues are very interesting. Um, and finally, because these computations are large, and also because um, there, I'll indicate there's some things we need to do specially. So a lot of the existing sparse linear algebra techniques in the literature don't work for us. So I'll, I'll describe some new techniques I've developed for these problems. So everything here is joint work with uh, Avner Ash, uh, my friend at Boston College, and Paul Gunnels, who's now at UMass Amherst. Okay. So just um, a few definitions and uh, alphabetical letters as I go along. So let G be GLNR, which is just the space of all n by n matrices of non-zero determinant. Um, and there's a geometric way to see an n by n matrix. I call it a marked lattice. So a marked lattice is just a lattice together with a distinguished lattice basis, you know, in this case E1 and E2. It's just a geometric way to describe the matrix because E1 is the first row of the matrix and E2 is the second row of the matrix. Um, and I'll let gamma be SLNZ, that's all n by n matrices of integer entries and determinant 1. And um, the way gamma is going to act on this picture, gamma acts by preserving the underlying lattice. So keep all the black dots uh, fixed as a set, but gamma will change the distinguished basis. So um, all of these bases, the black basis, the red basis, the green basis, and countably many other bases are all equivalent mod gamma. They all have de determinant the same volume of a fundamental parallelogram. So that uh, might suggest that I should define G mod gamma to be the space of all lattices. But um, we want to take it further. We want to consider two lattices to be the same if they differ by rotations, reflections, and homothetes. So, I mean, yeah. Th this is what we mean by the space of lattices. Consider a lattice, but if, it, if you're doing nothing but rotating, then you want to consider it to be the same lattice. So uh, let k be the set of g in, in g uh, that preserve the standard dot product. So k is just the orthogonal group generated, of course, by rotations and reflections. Um, k is a maximal compact subgroup of uh, this group of all invertible matrices. Then uh, homothetes means just changes of scale by the same positive real number in all directions. So what I'm doing with my hands, in the same in all directions positive scalar multiples of the identity. Um, then uh, I'll let x be g mod k times r plus. This is called the symmetric space for the group SLNR. Okay, geometrically speaking, x is just the space of these marked lattices, modulo, rotations, and uh, homothetes. Uh, question? Oh, you mean to combine the two of them? Yeah, how, do you, how are you combining them? It's, a, it's just matrix multiplication. See, R, is, R plus is the center, so R plus commutes with everything. R plus is scalar times the identity. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So geometrically, I've just got, you know, imagine a lattice with this marking, mod rotations and homothetes. So um, I'll do some specific examples in a minute. So what can we say about this space X in terms of generalities? Well, it's a manifold, first of all, just because it's a Lie group. 
It's a Lie group modulo, um, a closed subgroup, so it's a manifold. The dimension I've given there is you can check by chasing through uh, the usual computations. It's non-compact, a non-compact manifold, as you can imagine, by a, take any family of matrices in G where uh, in this family you have two consecutive eigenvalues and let those, the ratio of those two eigenvalues blow off to infinity. So that's going to go off to infinity in a non-compact way in X. Uh, the space is contractible. Uh, the, um, if you know numerical linear algebra, the easiest way to say that is uh, the QR decomposition. So the QR decomposition says take any, in my case, invertible n by n matrix, and you can decompose it as Q times R, where Q is orthogonal and R is upper triangular um, positives down the diagonal. Okay, I, the way I set it up, K was on the right, so Q should be on the right. It's called LQ, but it doesn't matter. Um, then, uh, so QR, I'm modding out by the Q part to contract away the R part, roughly speaking, as it's upper triangular matrices. So just take all the off diagonal entries and multiply them by a scalar running from one down to zero, and they go away. And do, do something similar on the diagonal to make it go away. Okay. Finally, symmetric space means that this X has a natural Riemannian metric, um, just coming from the Lie theory, but Riemannian metric of non-positive curvature and GX transitively preserving the metric everywhere. So that's an extremely strong condition. It that says that every point looks the same as every other point because the group can carry one to the other and preserving the, the exact metric as it goes. Okay. So now uh, I could define this uh, main object of study. The space of lattices, I'll be saying it's X mod gamma. So, so again, that's... But yeah, basically, remember, X was marked lattices, modular rotations. Modding out by gamma just means forget about the marking, forget about the distinguished basis. So now I do have all lattices, mod rotations, and homothetes. So again, it's a, um, it's a manifold because gamma is a discrete group. Um, up to, gamma itself has finite quotient singularity. It has, um, there are fixed points in X where gamma acts with a finite stabilizer. So it's not really a manifold, but I'll ignore that for this talk. It's still non-compact. Um, it's no longer contractible. In fact, the topology of X mod gamma is the main uh, thing I'm talking about today. But I'll be describing that. Um, it's called a locally symmetric space because, again, you take a symmetric space mod something discrete, and then at least locally it still has the, uh, the symmetric property of the metric. Um, a little digression I need to go into for two slides. Um, I said gamma was the set of all n by n matrices of integer entries in determinant one, I need to consider uh, certain subgroups of that of finite index called congruence subgroups. I won't write down a formal definition, but uh, the main example uh, that we use in our work is um, this uh, group called gamma naught of n, where n is a fixed uh, integer greater than one, and the matrix is just congruent to this mod n. It means in the right-hand column except for the diagonal, everything's congruent to zero mod n, and there's no other condition on the whole matrix except for determinant one. Okay. Um, so that's a, the way to understand that geometrically is that X mod gamma naught of n is a space of lattices with extra structure. So X mod gamma with lattices, X mod gamma naught of n is lattices with extra structure. Um, if you chase through the definition, the space is actually, it's a space of pairs of lattices L and L prime. Uh, think of L as the first lattice I was talking about. L prime is a sublattice of L, and the, uh, the uh, requirement, if you chase through everything, is that L mod L prime should be, uh, the quotient should be a cyclic group, and it should be a cyclic group of precisely order n. So we just look at this picture where the, uh, the origin, I'm, in all my pictures, the origin is down here in the second row from the bottom. Uh, so the set of all points, black and green, is a lattice. The set of green points is a sublattice of index two. And of course, the set of all points mod the greens is a cyclic group of order two because I go bing, bing. And uh, it's extra structure because there were three choices there. I could have, I chose this sort of angled checkerboard lattice, but I could have also chosen my green lattice to be all green up this line and then go two over and all green up this line, sort of like Paul Steinhardt's talk, only it's periodic. <laughs> Third choice is all green on the x-axis, all green on twice above the x-axis and so on. 
So by making that one out of three choices, that's my extra structure. Uh, so let me go in a little more detail on the uh, n equals 2 case. So, uh, so this is of classic uh, interest throughout mathematics. So uh, for n equals 2, the, this x is the upper half plane. So you can see that with a simple argument, which I wrote down. Um, so take any marked lattice, a lattice with a basis in it, the yeah, basis E1 and E2. I said I consider lattices the same if I... Uh, do rotation. So I'm going to rotate E1 so it points to the right along the x-axis. Then I said they're the same if you do a homothety. So I'm going to rescale in both directions till E1. I don't care where the basis is, you can make the choices a different way. You can um, take your lattice again from scratch and ask yourself what's the shortest vector in the lattice? You know, that's an NP-hard problem in general, but in abstract mathematics you find it right away by looking. To take the shortest vector, rotate it down to the positive <laughs> x-axis, <laughs> and uh, stretch it out to be a length one. Then uh, there's, there's some other basis vector in the lattice. Because the first one is the shortest, the second basis vector has got to lie outside of this circle, so up here somewhere. So let's say the shortest basis vector were over here, but now it's a lattice and the lattice contains the uh, vector of length 1 horizontally, so it must also contain this point over here where I, where I can move in the lattice length 1 horizontally. So this argument shows that uh, any lattice has a basis where the first one's at 1 and the second one is in this gray region. So this gray region is a fundamental domain for the action of gamma on the upper half plane. Okay, now... Uh, if you remember though, from complex analysis or uh, lots of other things, this picture again is, is absolutely uh, classic in mathematics. I, I guess going back to Felix Klein and and uh, and Fuchs and all. So um, I'd like to say a few words about why this uh, this project with space of lattices is important to us. Now this this is not the number theory seminar, so I'm just going to keep it extremely high level in one or two slides. But uh, this picture immediately suggests that um, or reminds us that. Modular forms are holomorphic functions on the upper half plane. With a, they obey a certain transformation law under gamma. They are connected to the representation theory of SL2R, to uh, number theory, and also to finite groups theory, things like moonshine. Um, X mod gamma is the moduli space of elliptic curves, at least over the complexes. Because you know, an elliptic curve over the complexes, it's, well, it's a complex torus. So that means you take the complex plane and mod out by a lattice, and you get the torus. But in the lattice, you don't care about rotations, and uh, by the theory, you also don't care about homothetes. So this is precisely the moduli of elliptic curves. Okay. So this whole circle of ideas, modular forms and elliptic curves, of course, is central in the number theory. But the, most, the best known you know, work maybe of the last 20 years is uh, Wiles's proof of Fermat's last theorem and the whole you know, semi-stable elliptic curve story. Um, but actually what Ash Gunnels and I are doing comes from another part of the story. Uh, just very briefly, for n equals 2, um, Eichler and Shimura and Deline have a body of work that relate the modular forms and elliptic curves to uh, Galois representations via the theory of L functions. So in one sentence at the bottom, our project, you know, Ash Gunnels and my project, is to do computational tests of analogous conjectures for um, n equals 4. Um, so what's the difference between n equals 2 and higher? Well, uh, like I say, in n equals 2, this was the upper, it's the complex upper half plane. But for this particular Lie group, SLN, once you get at n equals 3 or higher, the x is not defined over c. So a lot of the story that you can do in a sort of direct way with algebraic geometry and Shimura varieties, that story goes out the way for these groups. But one still has automorphic forms, which are generalizations of modular forms. The, uh, the Langlands conjectures relate automorphic forms to representation theory, number theory, and algebraic geometry. Um, well, why are we not doing computational tests of n equals 3? Well, Avner Ash has been um, doing it for years. He, he has a, a strong research program with many collaborators to do this kind of computation for uh, n equals 3. And I guess around nine, <coughs> 1993, he said, oh, you know, we, we can do it for n equals 4, too. And I 
Yeah, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we just do this, 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 this. Yeah, so let's do that. Okay. Let's see. But now, from the point of view of this seminar, um, the important thing to say about our work is we do not compute these automorphic forms directly. One can do that, but that's just simply not our project. So our project is specifically topological. So we compute the cohomology of these X mod gamma and then, and then the more general congruent subgroups X mod gamma prime. And we compute it with various coefficient systems, uh, V. Where the coefficient system gets acted on by, uh, by gamma and other things. And in, our, in the cases we're working on, it's known from your know, deep work on the automorphic form side that if we, if we compute this cohomology by machine, and if we find non-zero cohomology classes, then it's known they're going to give rise to automorphic forms. And then the automorphic forms are going to give rise to L functions and so on and so forth. But of course, the cohomology is easier to compute uh, directly than the other objects. Okay. So uh, how do we compute the cohomology? Well, uh, of course, as we've seen, I guess, in uh, you know, both the previous talks today, we want to uh, get a finite cell complex or a finite simplicial complex into the action and do the computations on that, uh, on that complex. So I guess in the... Uh, Early 80s, Ash, Amner Ash introduced a subspace W inside of X, which is a gamma equivariant deformation retraction of X, and we call this the well rounded retract. If you know Avner Ash, he's a well rounded guy. He reads Plato, I'm not exaggerating, he reads Plato in the original, he reads the Talmud in the original, and he, you know, yeah, he reads Derrida, and, well, in translation, but you can't have everything. Um, so, um, so this W is a regular cell complex. I'm going to describe it in a page of uh, prose first, and then I'll be uh, doing some uh, more geometric examples. So, um, so first, a few definitions. Yeah. Consider a uh, given lattice L. The minimal value of the lattice L is going to be the shortest length among the lengths of all the non-zero vectors in the lattice. So it's just what's the shortest length from origin out to a point of the lattice. And the minimal vectors of L are points in the lattice that attain this minimum, whose length is M of L. So here's a, a, the way you characterize the well-rounded retract cells. Um, if a lattice L has a certain set of minimal vectors, you, you color them red or something, check them off, then you want to deform the lattice by you know, you know, shearing motions or bending certain angles open while keeping it a lattice. If you can deform your lattice into another lattice L prime, and you never change the set of minimal vectors, then L and L prime are in the same open cell of the well-rounded retract. Um, now, uh, so what, what about closed cells? Well, a lattice L prime is in the closure of the cell containing L. If, if when you deform L into L prime, there's a moment at the end of the deformation when you suddenly get more minimal vectors than you had yeah, from L. Okay. Again, I'll be showing pictures of that in a moment. Um, another thing that says the retraction uses several steps, and in, in each step, we're going to have a vector subspace sitting inside the lattice that's spanned by a subset of the lattice, sort of rationally. And we're going to, in the well-rounded retraction, we deform L by taking that subspace, fixing all the points in it pointwise, and then shrink Rn, shrink the ambient Rn in all directions orthogonal to S. And that's going to shrink the lattice that way. Um, by the way, I mentioned the metric, uh, the, yeah, the symmetric metric on the symmetric space earlier. Um, it turns out that all the shrinking motions in the well-rounded attraction are actually geodesic flows in the technical sense in the Riemannian manifold. So that, that's a theorem Ash and I proved in '96. And uh, when you study the compactifications of X mod gamma, you, you have to flow out toward in the uh, infinity, and we, you know, we studied how flowing out toward infinity relates to flowing inward toward the well-rounded retract. Okay, well, I apologize for the garishness of this picture, what I've done to Klein and Fricke, but uh, this red thing is the well-rounded retract for n equals two. So let me, uh, let me describe how this goes. So let's, let's pick an arbitrary point in, in a, the space of lattices, and then I'm going to show you how to retract it onto the red set. So um, for, I'll pick again the lattice where one basis element you know, is a vector stretching from 0 to 1, 
and then another basis vector stretches up here again. It, I'll choose the second vector to be longer than the first vector so it lies outside this circle. And uh, I, did, I did my sliding trick to slide it into the fundamental domain. So the, uh, the well-rounded retraction just says, well, I told you down here this was the shortest vector in the lattice. So that's, that's a minimal vector. We're going to take the linear subspace through the minimal vectors. There's only one of them, so that, that's a line. We're going to take this line. And in all directions orthogonal to the line, we're just going to shrink uniformly. So in this picture, two dimensions are very simple. It's just a uniform downward motion. So the, the well-rounded retraction, what it does to the basis is leave the bottom one, what's wrong here? Leave the bottom one fixed. And the vector going up here gets shrunk vertically down until it hits this arc. And then it, then it stops. So now we can see why this is a regular cell complex, at least in this picture. So this whole two-dimensional region is going to flow down uniformly and lie on this arc. So this arc is, well, it, in the case of n equals 2, w is only one-dimensional. w is just a graph. So this edge is one of the edges of the graph. Um, there's another fundamental domain like this. If, it flows, the, the whole retraction is gamma equivariant, which means it flows down in a similar way here. But up to gamma equivalence, this arc is the same as that arc, just because this domain was, could be carried to this domain. Um, gamma equivariance also means that from here, actually the geodesics in this Klein picture are you know, circles that are mutually tangent, you know, perpendicularly at, at the origin. So the retraction flows up here along those circular arcs. And in this, this bottom region here is a fundamental domain, and it flows up to the bottom of this arc, and so forth. So Any questions? Obviously, a general principle here. So, yeah. how do you know that your your collapsing that you're doing is, mm -hmm. is equivariant? I mean, is it like you look at the fibers of your retraction; they should not cross the fundamental domain, or something like that? Yeah. How do you? Well, yeah, it's um, like I said. You you fixed a subspace, uh, so a rational subspace S in the lattice. You're moving orthogonally down, and you, you basically, get, yeah, yeah. I should introduce the notion of uh, it, whatever lattice you're picturing. Imagine the sphere of radius one around the origin, sort of as a, as a glass thing that's not moving. And you just ask yourself the question: As I shrink in my lattice, what's the first point of the lattice that's not on S that's going to hit the sphere? And uh, as soon as something hits the sphere, you stop. That gives me the next bigger dimension of S. Then I fix that S and shrink in the other directions. So I'm not sure that it doesn't directly. Yeah, why is yeah. this retraction? I mean, it looks like it's not crossing anything, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, if, it, if your retraction tried to come sideways and cross the fundamental of those lines, then it would not be good. Right, that's right. There's some principle that relates yeah. the fibers of your retraction yeah. to the fundamental domain, and it's not so clear right. what guarantees that you have. Yeah. In this case, I believe you've got. Yeah. So, so in the three-dimensional case, let, let's say we have a uh, we have a plane that's that we are fixed and that we're shrinking down in the third dimension, the orthogonal to the plane. The, the reason it's gamma invariant is, if I have a plane through my lattice, then uh, there's some you know finite distance where there's nothing in the lattice, and then there's another plane through the lattice with the next set of points on it. You know, this could, so that yeah. So call that like the plane one unit higher or something. The plane one unit higher is studded with these lattice points, and uh, it's one of them is going to hit the sphere first when I push it down. But the reason it's gamma equivariant is all those points like were equivalent under the translation group of gamma. So each, you know, under translations, each one of those points had an equal chance to hit the sphere first, and one of them does, and that's where you stop. But. That's right. Okay, let's see. Any, any other questions? Um, let's see, what, uh, what to s I think in, in talking and gesturing, I've already uh, suggested how the well-rounded retract uh, goes for, uh, for uh, n equals c in three space. If the lattice, say, is in general position, you can um, First, first, just to take any lattice and take a sphere at the origin of unit radius. 
shrink the whole lattice in by a homothety until one point touches it. That determines the line through the lattice. Now fix the line and go consider cylinders going around the line. Shrink the cylinders in in a uniform orthogonal way. A then generically just one second point is going to hit the sphere. That determines a plane. Now fix the plane and shrink in like parallel planes orthogonally until a third point hits the sphere. And that's the whole retraction. So what's, uh, the, what's this picture of the Soleil cube? It, uh, that's a, so that's a picture of the fundamental domain for W and N equals 3, the way that single red arc was the, like the fundamental unit for, uh, in the N equals 2 case. So I, I've suggested a picture here that when the retraction is done, for general lattices, there's a, a unit sphere with three points on it forming a lattice basis. And if you want to think about walking around in the well-rounded retract, but staying on the retract, then you have to uh, move those three points around on the sphere and keep them on the sphere and uh, sort of delicately deform the lattice so it's still a lattice while you're doing this. And then, and then what, you're, what you're looking for is places where those other points, not just those three points, but other points suddenly come onto the sphere because that's how you get, that's how you pass from the interior of this three cell to, um, to, the, uh, to the faces or to the edges or the vertices. Um, uh, one thing I forgot to illustrate in this picture is, um, so I've described the lattice whose basis was here and here. I never talked about the lattice whose basis was here and at this triple point. Well, that's, if there's a lattice point here, and here at horizontal one, then there's also a lattice point here horizontally one over. So you see the, the hexagon appearing. And so that's in fact the lattice, that's the closest packing lattice in the plane. That's the closest, take a lot of pennies, pack them into a hexagonal grid on your desk. So, uh, so by analogy, at the corner of this, of this region, this, I claim this is the uh, fundamental domain for W and N equals three. What's a corner of that? Well, that's the uh, closest packing lattice in R3. So I think of it as the lattice of oranges in the, in the grocery store. You know, put, <laughs> pack lattices hexagonally on the bottom of the grocery store's table, then pack another hexagonal layer of oranges on top of that and keep going. The, uh, I guess, more technical term for that is the face-centered cubic lattice in crystallography or the, uh, the kind of last, you know, Tom Hales has, has uh, studied carefully. So that closest packing lattice is um, here at this corner, in a, you know, with a different basis here at this corner and with a different basis at this corner. Um, so how could I walk from this point, say, into the, into the two-dimensional face here? Well, that's why I brought my cube octahedron. Um, so this cube octahedron is you take the ordinary cube and truncate off the eight vertices and you, you truncate them so that they touch at corners that used to be in the edge centers of the cube. It, so it turns out this cubic, the, this cubic octahedron, excuse me, this cubic octahedron has 12 vertices, and those 12 points together with the point in the center, which I've used the origin, those are centers of the spheres in that closest uh, orange packing. So this is a convenient way to look at it. So I, so I imagine this, um, there's a sphere that, the circumscribed sphere of this thing goes perfectly through all of the 12 vertices on the outside. So now I'd like to ask, how can I deform this sphere, it's not it's the wrong word, how can I deform the lattice so that not all 12 points are on it, but you know, fewer are on it, and how can I um, explore what kind of degeneracies I can get? Well, if I hold it up to you this way, you can see a hexagon going around it. So uh, by s slicing through the lattice, there shows, that shows there's a, a plane where the lattice points make a hexagon, you know, the, one of the oranges planes. So let's, let's say now, I'm going to try to deform this and get us into this hexagonal face. So I put my fingers around the hexagon and view all the lattice points in that plane as fixed. And I'm going to take this top point here, move it, on, slide it on the unit sphere just a little bit down. 
well, it's still a lattice, so this plane has to move parallel, and these points have to come off, so they're going to come down a little bit. But since this is on the sphere and this is a triangle, these have got to get longer. So now I have a thing where the minimal vectors are a hexagonal lattice in one plane, one point in a third dimension, and, and nothing else is minimal anymore. And of course, I have two degrees of freedom when I um, to yeah, move that thing around be because it's one point on a sphere and I can move it around a two-dimensional way. So that's why I have a two-dimensional face here. Why, uh, why is it a... It's a hexagon because, let's see, why is it? Basically, there, there's got to come a point where some points from back here are going to come back onto the sphere. But I have six different directions where I can choose how to do this. I can uh, pull it down here and make points from up here come down, or points 60 degrees over come down, and so forth. So it becomes a hexagon. Um, um, why is there a triangular face here? That's not the face-centered lattice, but that's the body-centered cubic lattice. The body-centered cubic lattice is, imagine your, I think of it as imagine your standard Z3 you know, cubical lattice, and then checkerboard it with you know, evens, odds, evens, odds, and take away all the odd points. So take away uh, half of the points. So, so the, um, you can take this, consider the circumscribed sphere of the eight points on the, you know, on the outside. So what are the ways I can deform that thing? Well, I could take that cube and I can make it a box that gets longer this way. And the way to make it get longer this way and still stay on the sphere is I have to shrink the squares on the sides by some kind of cosine thing or something. So that's one degree of freedom I have is to make it long, but you know, a long rectangular box, but a little narrower. Second degree of freedom is make it tall but a little narrower this way. Uh, a third degree of freedom is to go out this way, but that's equivalent to a, a combination of the first two through, uh, through the homothetes. You know. ABC equals one is up to logarithms, a uh, two-dimensional thing. Okay, well, that's some... Um, okay, so that's... That's right, yeah, the body set of cubic lattice itself is right here, and then I've been moving away from it in a two-dimensional way. Yeah. FCC is where? What's that? Where's FCC? Because you can just start with FCC and do that. So FCC is the vertices of this thing. So, you get, so each of those three things are the, are the stretches of the DCC lattice, which is the FCC. Right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, all right, so I think I'll skip that a bit. Um, oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, right. So I've described the, the uh, I've described the cells of the well-rounded retract. Um, let's, You'd want to know how to list all the cells and study the face relations. I think I'll skip that part at this point. But um, suffice it to say that you know, each cell was determined by its minimal vectors. And when you go to a face, you get you know, a larger set of minimal vectors, like, a, you know, like going from, you know, or the easiest way to describe it is we were just saying going out of the vertex into an edge is like taking the FCC lattice and deforming it a bit. So these, these things are fundamentally combinatorial things and can be a, you could keep track of them in a computer just by combinatorics. Like the uh, FCC lattice has 12 minimal vectors. They, we always identify them in pairs because they always occur in plus and minus pairs. So there's really six pairs. Moving off of that into an edge was like just choosing five out of the six pairs. And that kind of combinatorics can be kept track of in your computer. So that suggests we can, uh, we can compute with a cell complex. So I'll, uh, now I'd like to introduce these uh, HECA operators. So now we're back to uh, yeah, looking into the lattices. So if, um, if L is any lattice and M is a sublattice of finite index, well, to start with, I want to just uh, recall the definition of Smith normal form. So. Um, 
the, the basic theorem is that uh, L mod M is always going to be a direct sum of cyclic groups. This is you know, you know, a very fundamental fact we all learn. And the, um, the basic rule is that uh, we have, yeah. it's determined by scalars, all scalars greater than or equal to one, and you arrange it so that you have divisibility, A1 divisible by A2, A2 divisible by A3, and so forth. The proof is roughly, if you have any lattice L and sublattice M, again, if, if you could look with your eyes, you'd, because M has finite index, there's only finitely many directions you can go in L away from the origin. Look at the one that has the longest sequence of dots in L before you hit the next dot in M. That's a scalar A n, mod out in that direction. Now in every other direction you've got fewer things you can go before you hit M and just uh, recurse on that. Okay. But these A i's are known as the invariant factors of the pair L m and they are the diagonal entries in the Smith normal form of a matrix giving a basis of M with respect to a basis of L. So I need the Smith normal form to define these HECA correspondences. I've just, uh, we copied the previous formula here. But the thing to note is that for a fixed L and fixed values of these constants A1 through AN, only finitely many sublattices M satisfy this equation. It's like we saw before, if uh, given L, there's only, you know, if you want to go a n steps before you get to another point in M, there's only, because um, imagine the cube, if you're in D dimensions, imagine the D dimensional cube of side length a n, there's only finitely many directions you can go in that. So there's, there's only finitely many ways to choose the M in that direction and so on. But so now I'm in a situation I've got a lattice L and only finitely many sublattices with a certain property. So I can um, define the HECA correspondence, T, and given this set of A's, it's the one-to-many map from the space of lattices to itself given by you just map L to the set of all M satisfying this relation. So it's a very combinatorial thing. Given one lattice, consider all its sublattices M with this fixed quotient property, and just take the set of all of those M's, a one-to-many map. Okay. So here's a, an example very similar to the one I did in green. Um, but uh, the HECA correspondence T12 in for the uh, two-dimensional case it's generically a one to three map because, again, given a less, there's only, and again, the origin is always second row from the bottom. There's only three ways to uh, put an index two sublattice in the horizontal way, the vertical way, and the checkerboard way. So the Hecker correspondence maps the one, the one lattice that consists of all the points, and it maps it to the three lattices consisting of this red lattice, that red lattice, and that red lattice. Now, it's just a correspondence, there's no algebraic structure on it yet, but we can take formal z-linear combinations of these correspondences and we can compose them, and this makes them into a ring. Um, it's a commutative ring, essentially, because L itself is commutative, yeah. and because we're taking all possible sublattices, say, take all possible sublattices of index 2, and within them take all possible sublattices of index 3, and you're going to get all possible sublattices of index 6, and up to how you index them, it's going to commute. So it's a commutative ring. Then there's a, a general fact that the HECA correspondences, at least for SL and Z, form a ring on these generators. You, um, as I suggested by saying 2 and 3, you, uh, yeah, you split it up by the primes, and you, uh, a basis is you take T111 PPP with K copies of the P for K running from 1 to N. And that, that generates everything. So uh, you could consider you know, sublattices that are of index P or sublattices that are of index P squared, but the, the, uh, the two P's have to be in different dimensions and so forth. 
Now, uh, the Hecke correspondence, because it's like it's picking up a point in your topological space and smushing it down to a finite number of other points of the space. Um, so something like that is going to act on cohomology. Uh, so the, uh, the Hecke correspondences descend to a ring of Hecke operators on the cohomology. And the, uh, this, because again, it's a commutative ring, so they, uh, you can, uh, it's simultaneously diagonalizable. And so the, um, the spectrum of the eigenvalues for the Hecke operators is central in our number theory applications and central to, uh, to our project, certainly. Now, uh, just, I don't have time to go into how, uh, how we actually compute the Hecke operators. But I'd like to uh, at least mention these two algorithms. I think I'll go to the picture first. Go back to this picture. The, uh, the trouble with the Hecke operators is they don't respect this structure W at all. So if I take a, uh, take a point here, and let's consider the Hecke operator T12 in this two-dimensional space. So that means I'm, uh, I'm supposed to take this lattice and turn it into three other lattices. Well, one of the lattices is the, uh, is the horizontal one. You know, take, just take every other row horizontally, and take that sublattice. If you chase through all the coordinates, it's not obvious from here, but that's going to end up up here. It's, the way you get to it is you draw a diagonal line from here to here and just double the diagonal line's length. And that's so the image, one of the three images of the Hecke correspondence is up here. And the, the other two have slightly more complicated things. But the, uh, the fact that I said take a diagonal line, that's the bad news already because the well-rounded retraction, as I said, was at least from up here flowing down vertically. So, and the diagonal line doesn't respect the vertical at all. So in fact, the, the way to think about the Hecke correspondence is it doesn't just move a point to three other points. It moves this whole red graph to three other graphs one of them is like up here, and the cells don't intersect the cells of this in any nice way, and the, the other two are down here yeah, in a complicated way. So, so to consider this action on, hom like in this case, homology, you'd have to lift this graph up by a factor of two. This arc would now get twice as big. So one of its corner points is like lying over this midpoint, and the other corner point is lying over this midpoint. Now you've got to push it down by a retraction, but so the arc was arcing up. So if you push it down and its endpoints touch here, you then have to push it down further so that it goes down into this corner and down into this corner. Um, I mean, you can do this in the you can do these computations in the case of T one two, but then trying to do them for general Hecke operators T like PP, and to do them for uh, n equals three or n equals four is much more daunting. Um, I got to tell the story of, of Dinika Ramakrishnan's dream. So uh, we were, there was a meeting about this general kind of stuff at uh, Montreal in, I guess, 1988. And uh, Dinika Ramakrishnan had been thinking about how do we uh, compute Hecke operators in a topological way. And then he talked to us one day about it. Then that night he had a dream. And in the dream he saw the images of all these cells doing the thing I just said and falling, after the stretching, falling back down on each other and having to be bent in this way to get back to the original complex. And he came in the morning and saying that the dream had shown him that you, know, you can never compute Hecke. Okay, I won't say never. You know, he said it would be so hard to compute Hecke operators in, these, in this way. Look at all this complexity. So later I told this gentleman in the front row about this dream of Dinekers. And uh, Bob said, no, I have my dreams too. <laughs> so. <laughs> And um, perhaps I should say then that Paul Gunnels, Bob's student, has realized this dream in some cases. Well, okay, so to describe algorithms for computing Hecke operators in this well-rounded retract context, uh, first I've got to mention Avner Ash's own algorithm with, uh, with Lee Rudolph back around 84, I think. So um, their algorithm has, has the great virtue that it generalizes continued fractions from n equals 2 to all n. But it, uh, it only works for the top degree cohomology. I'm going to let nu be the degree of w. 
It only works for the top degree cohomology of, uh, of, of the space we're computing. The, the top degree cohomology is because I've suggested that when these generic, when you, know, you, you take a generic lattice and retract it, you're going to hit the, you know, the generic top dimensional cell. And I've suggested that's when you have exactly n minimal vectors on the sphere and not more. So then you're working with an n by n matrix. And if you do certain changes of coordinates, it's an integral matrix. And you can imagine uh, continued fractions is just a, can be regarded as a, an operation on a two by two matrix. So it's like finding the continued fraction for a five halves or something as you make a matrix five, two, one, zero, and then you do some like Euclidean operations on it and you get the result. So Ash Rudolph has uh, generalized that to, uh, to uh, n dimensions. But uh, in our work, as I'll mention in the next slide, we needed, we needed to get away from the top degree cohomology. Top degree cohomology in any space is always a bit easier than uh, others because you know that all the co-cycles, you know that everything's a co-cycle because it's top degree cohomology. The boundary is going to send everything to zero. So you only have to worry about, in cohomology, about the quotient by the boundary matrices. But uh, when you're not at the top degree, you have to worry about both. So uh, Paul Gunnels came up with a very elegant algorithm for doing this using something called the Sharbley complex, which, yeah, worth, I can't describe the Sharbley complex, but it's uh, roughly speaking, you'd consider these sets of minimal vectors, but you, you also allow yourself to consider one or more other vectors. It's the kind of formal complex we get in topology sometimes where you, uh, you take all vectors, all integer vectors uh, forming a certain kind of rectangular matrix. So it's a, a thing with a countable infinite basis in every dimension, but you can prove it's homotopically equivalent to the uh, complexes we study. And with that extra freedom of using all integer vectors, he, uh, and by building roofs over cycles and things like that, he, he works out an algorithm for heck operators. Okay. So, um, well, this is just a summary slide. The, the rest of the talk is on a particular paper where uh, we do our, our computational work of this type for n equals 4 with uh, constant coefficients over the complexes. From now on, this group gamma prime is going to be the group gamma naught of n I defined earlier. Oh, uh, wait, yeah. Back to the last slide. Is that the state of the art at the moment? Um, I believe so, yes. Yeah. I, th I think that's, yeah, I think that's right. Even for even two degrees down, I don't think that he knows how to do it. And then we, we've also tried to generalize to the symplectic group, and there we think we have it, but then we don't quite. Yeah. Okay. All right, so in, the, uh, so in the last few minutes, as I've indicated, the, um, these computations are going to get very large. So um, it's easy to see how I'm, a, I'm going to say that the, um, size of these matrices is proportional to n cubed, where n was this constant in gamma naught of n. Basically, uh, well, yeah, okay, I won't, yeah, I won't attempt to justify it. There's a parameter n, there's a parameter n in my, uh, in the definition of the groups I'm considering. Basically, in, uh, imagine Z4, and if there's a parameter n in it, it turns out that the number of cells I have to consider grows as n in the first dimension times n in the second dimension times n in the third dimension. And it would be times n in the fourth dimension except for something about the homothetes. So, uh, so it's growing as n cubed. So, so the number of cells of any given dimension in the well-rounded retract grows as n cubed for the family of subgroups we're considering. So that means the size of the matrices grows as n to the sixth. Okay. Because um, in our particular application, we need to look at H5. So I'll be, um, because H5 is, you take the boundary maps D5 and D4 in a chain, in a co-chain complex, and with D4 times D5 equals zero, that's how you index it. So those are the sizes. We, uh, the uh, largest group we considered was where th the matrix D4, which is the bigger of the two matrices we want to reduce, is about a million by 3.2 million um, in size. But the, these matrices are very sparse, though. They're, um, they've only got about six entries per column and about 26 per row if you count up everything. Because after all, the, 
that a Soule cube, and here I have a model of it, it's, uh, well, I'm talking about n equals 4, so I can't hold up, the, the Soule cube would be six dimensional, so I can't hold that up. But there's only a, a very, f off of any face, there's only a very few bordering faces, so that makes the matrix sparse, I guess, as always in topology. So uh, how do we do the computation? We find the Smith normal form of our matrices. Um, so as I indicated, Smith, well, Smith normal form of a matrix is, if the matrix has integer entries, you do row operations on the left, you know, you know, subtract a multiple of one row off of another row, but it's always an integer multiple, because in Smith normal form we're sort of in an integer world. So you find an integer matrix on the left of determinant one, and another integer matrix on the right of determinant one, and when you're done, you have those Smith normal form coefficients down the diagonal, satisfying the condition, first one divides the second one, that one divides the third one, that one divides the fourth one. So this is a setup for the rest of the talk. Every matrix, every cohomology matrix I look at, I'll always be decomposing it into a capital D as a diagonal matrix with integers dividing each other down the diagonal. But P, P and Q are on the two sides there change of basis matrices, integer entries determinant plus or minus one. Okay. I remark here we prefer to work over Z because that's arbitrary precision because then we can compute the torsion of our topological space. Uh, like in this example, the torsion tends to be sort of small but non-trivial. I mean, even for, for these things with millions of cells, the torsion might be, oh, there's something Z mod 11 somewhere in the cohomology. I, I don't know why it's 11, but, okay. but um, uh, in practice, though, we find that uh, when we do linear algebra with integer entries in the matrix, you get integer explosion as you do it. So uh, after a certain point, we have to stop. And uh, our dirty little secret is that we work over a finite field. I chose the finite field of order 1, 2, 3, 7, 9, because it's close to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And, and we, we sort of pretend that that finite field is the complex numbers. Okay. Now, uh, okay, computationally speaking, this, this slide is sort of the main, uh, the main point. To find, to find heck operators, we must compute and store the change of basis matrices P and Q. Um, the reason is, again, when I had those red arcs on the screen and I said, we lift them up and then you have to push them back and it would look ugly if you tried to do it geometrically. That looking ugly if you tried to do it geometrically is algebraically is encoded in this P and Q. The, the P says, there, well, that big arc, when you doubled its length, you had to use half of the first cell, then all of the middle cell, and then half of the third cell. Yeah, P embodies that information. So for everything I'm doing with Paul Gunnels, we, we need those P's and Q's. But this rules out uh, some of the leading linear algebra techniques for, there's been a lot of work on Smith normal form uh, today, in, in the last uh, 10 years, 20 years. So f the, um, maybe the leading idea is to parallelize everything, where you can um, reduce a matrix mod P for many, say, 16-bit P, and then in parallel you can compute either Smith normal form diagonal entries for each different P, and then you can use bounds, actually you know, real numbers, sort of numerical analysis bounds in the D4, to reassemble the whole Smith normal form by Chinese remaindering at the end. So, uh, I guess the, the main paper, if I could only say one paper for where this idea came from, it's Dumas, Saunders, and Villard of 2001. Um, another paper by sort of the same group that had interesting comparisons to ours was this five author paper of 2007. So they did GL7, whereas we were only doing GL4. Um, so GL3, for three dimensions, I emphasize the orange, the lattice of oranges. Um, for GL7, you have to ask how many different sort of extreme lattices are there in seven series. How many lattices have a regular packing that's at least a local minimum for minimizing volume? And I forget the exact numbers. I for GL7, I think it's in the hundreds or something. So they, this was a tremendous computational work for them. Though it turns out their number, uh, their matrix size is about the same as ours because they were only doing n equals one. But anyway, my um, point is that we can't use this technique because it's it's unknown how to get the P and Q for, for the different primes P. For each prime P, you could get a P and Q matrix, but they're not going to have anything to do with each other. 
and it's not known how to Chinese remainder them up and lift them to a common P and Q. Okay. Um, other things we might try iterative methods like uh, the Wiedemann's method or Lancet's methods that just that solve AX equals B by, um, without reducing A at all, just by doing iterations. Um, again, they don't give you the P and Q. Um, people have asked whether these matrices have a block triangular form or a banded diagonal form like in PDEs. Uh, the answer is when your well-rounded reach axis of dimension six, then the matrices would have a beautiful banded diagonal form if you could view them in dimension six. But you can't. We, matrices live in dimension two. There, it, a matrix is a projection from dimension six down to dimension two. So, okay. So the, um, the techniques or the software I've developed to uh, answer this question instead is, uh, I call it Shifham. Um, so it uses cl more classical methods like Gaussian elimination, but it orders the steps differently. And um, I was able to solve that million by three million matrix on a uh, four gig Linux laptop, which I didn't bring today, but it's, uh, it's still going strong. The, the code is available at my uh, website here. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it reduced a million by 3.2 million and survived. So very briefly, I could say a bit about the techniques I, um, I use in Shifam for this kind of problem. The, uh, the first is a, uh, I'll go ahead, this, Markowitz is not due to me. This is a good idea from the 70s. But so the, uh, the main problem with sparse linear algebra is fill-in. So here's the idea. Let's say here's a matrix, and you want to do row and column operations to reduce it. And let's say you've, you've identified this as a pivot you want to work with. The, um, the main idea is that, you see, below this pivot, there are three non-zeros. And also next to this pivot, there are three non-zeros. The claim is that, in general, after you row reduce by this pivot down here, and then also column reduce across, you're going to have nine non-zeros here. It's, the reason is, use this pivot to cancel all of these. Say this was five. Then five times those three numbers are going to get added to those three numbers. Well, because it was sparse, you know, these zeros suddenly become non-zero. And by the law of averages, this number, whatever it was, doesn't equal five times that number. So they'll all be non-zeros. So, so the Markowitz count is r minus 1 times c minus 1. For any given pivot, it's number of non-zeros below it times minus 1 times number of non-zeros to the right of it, minus 1. And the way I do it is at every stage when I look for a pivot in my matrix, I spend the time to loop through the whole matrix and look for a pivot that minimizes the Markowitz count with various bookkeeping to try to find the Markowitz count fast. Okay. Um, a second trick is the, uh, these change of basis matrices that we need are too big to store in memory. So take a, if you have a sparse matrix, yeah, I can hold the sparse matrix in memory, but any kind of change of basis thing tends to be dense. Just, you know, I'm adding row 10 to row 11, then I'm adding row 10 to row 15, and later row 11 to somebody else. It, everybody gets a chance to interact pretty much, so they're dense. So I don't want to hold them in memory. This was a stopping point for many years. And then I thought, OK, I'm just going to write it to disk. So for every elementary operation of add, like k times one row to another, I write a little thing to disk saying, OK, I added k times this row to that row. That's only three integers worth. But uh, as always the change of basis matrices, you thing you really need is the inverse. So the way you, you get the inverse is you uh, C lets you read a file backwards from the end to the beginning. So you just read it backwards, read each little formal you know, elementary matrix, you, and then just formally invert them as you go. So it turns out this, uh, this worked well. Then, um, OK, finally, the thing that was really decisive uh, for us is uh, the bigger of our two matrices, you, you reduce the. Uh, Smaller one for, the smaller one is D5, the bigger one is D4. You reduce D5 first to get its change of base. This matrix happens to be Q5 on that side. And you compute Q5 times D4, call it eta. And so I don't really compute the Smith normal form of D4, rather of this eta. So why is this good? Well, um, D5 times D4 is 0, that basic equation of cohomology. But that implies D5 times eta is 0. D5 is this diagonal matrix. It's the number of non-zeros down at the, its uh, diagonal is the rank of 
the fifth boundary matrix. So if D5 times 8 is 0, that just means 8 has got a whole lot of 0 rows at its top. So by investing the work in computing this Q5 first, you sort of get rid of all the junk in, in a D4. You get an eta which has zeros in all the places it can, and you just have to reduce eta from there. So I, I had this idea at one point. Uh, I thought, like well, a lot of ideas, so that would be a couple days to program or probably not worth anything. Finally, Christmas break after, um, after uh, what, Christmas 2007, we were visiting a friend, and I, you know, everyone slept late except me. So it was Myrtle Beach, so I sat there, looked at the beach, and wrote this code. And then January 1st, 2008, suddenly, like, this, this thing is working. I, I had been trying to solve matrices 20 times smaller than the, the one I finally did. And in, instead of, like, taking days and crashing, this thing made it work in, like, a few hours. So then, with this idea, I kept going to bigger and bigger matrices and finally, finally did the biggest one. Okay, well, I believe that's it, and it's time. So, uh, any final questions? Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.